walks on water, who stills the storm, who offers faith and comfort in the silence. We pray that we may have the courage and the faith to follow you, no matter where you may lead us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. I want to talk about three things today. Courage, faith and silence. And I hope you'll see that in some peculiar way they're actually all linked together. I've just started reading a book which is a series of diaries written by somebody who died in the First World War. And the book has been lent to me by one of my fellow bases in Jacksbury Chorus. And we were talking about the First World War one day, and he said, well, actually, one of my ancestors won the Victoria Cross. And I said, oh, who, who was that then? And he said, well, Billy Congreve. And actually, we have two VCs in our family because his father won the Victoria Cross as well. I felt I could do nothing except be in awe and be silent and think, I wonder what genes you now carry from your forebears. Courage takes so many different forms. We may not all go into battle. In fact, pray God we don't. We may not ever have to face the kind of things that people faced in the first war or indeed in the second or in conflict since. But we actually all face our own battles in life in one way or another. And it takes courage sometimes to face them. A difficult diagnosis of an illness, the bereavement of somebody that we love deeply, the loss of a pet, the moving from one place to another. And sometimes courage has positive aspects too. The bravery to take decisions that are hard, but nevertheless we know in our heart of hearts are right. And so we do them, and when we look back, we find, usually, that it's the right decision after all, and we wonder why we didn't take it long ago. Courage then takes a number of different forms. So does faith. So, in a sense, does silence. Silence doesn't just mean the absence of noise, but something deep and profound. And that's why I love building times of silence into the services. Because it's then, in the profundity of silence, that we sometimes meet God. Or at least God has a chance to get through the noise of our earthly lives and say, well, Nigel, are you really listening to me? Or going your own sweet way? as usual. Two heroes of the faith we've heard about this morning, Elijah and Peter. And I just need to explain a little bit about Elijah. Um, as an American website says, he's right up there amongst the prophets. Well, <clears throat> yes, I don't think I'd quite put it that way, but he is a major prophet. Uh, he has quite a lot to say on behalf of God and quite a lot to do, and his work includes a great deal of courage. Courage mixed, it has to be said, with trepidation and with fear. And it's hardly surprising when you hear what it was he faced. The kingdom was divided into two kingdoms. In the north, the ten tribes of Israel formed the kingdom of Israel. And the latest of their kings in Elijah's time was a man called Aram. And Aram that you may not be surprised to know, had a wife called Jezebel. And you can work out what that meant. I'll tell you a little bit more about her in just a second. Those were the ten tribes in the northern part, the kingdom of Israel. In the southern part were the rump of the tribes, what was left, Benjamin and Judah, just two tribes. But they had the capital city of Jerusalem, that which had been the capital anyway. Elijah was a prophet from the south, 
what had happened in the north was that over generations, people had not listened to the word of God at all. And in fact, Jezebel had imported from her own native land Baals, those who appeared to be gods but weren't. And she had a great company of prophets, huge numbers of them, and people followed them and worshipped them slavishly. God said to Elijah, get up, go, do something about it. And Elijah did what many of us do. What? Me? Surely there's somebody else you could send, isn't there? Can't I take a back seat somewhere? No, Elijah, it's you. So Elijah went off and eventually he confronted the prophets of Baal and he set up a test on a mountain. There were two bulls. The prophets could choose one bull and he would choose the other and the bulls were sacrificed and when they were sacrificed they were made ready to be burned but the fire was not lit. The prophets of Baal spent all day from early morning till noon weeping and wailing and praying and asking the gods of Baal to come down and ignite the bull that they had chosen to sacrifice and nothing happened. So they started doing what quite often they did, which was to cut themselves with swords and knives and make the blood flow. And as they did so, they continued praying until the evening when they were exhausted. Elijah teased them mercilessly and basically said, stand aside. And he asked for four large jars of water to be poured twice over the burnt offering until it ran into a trench that he had had dug around the burnt offering. And then he prayed. And as he prayed silently, suddenly fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering com completely and licked up all the water. And the people who watched were amazed and they realized that the prophets of Baal were no more than charlatans. They chased them down to the river, and every single one of them was killed. Understandably, Jezebel, who was a great supporter of them, uh, was not very pleased with Elijah, to say the least, and said to him, Well, may the same happen to you by this time tomorrow as you have done to the prophets of Baal. Uh, at that point, Elijah decided that a clean pair of heels was the best kind of exit he could think of. So with his servant, he ran. And eventually he left his servant behind and went and hid in a cave on Mount Horeb. And that's where we find him this morning as we read that reading. And the servant of the Lord, the servant of God, comes and says, And what are you doing here then, Elijah? Get up. And Elijah pours out that tale of woe. Well, you know how zealous I've been. I've done everything you asked of me. I've killed all the prophets. I've restored your name in, in Israel. I've done all this. I've done all that. Now it's time for me to retire. Oh, no. Oh, no. Listen to God. <coughs> so, Elijah begins to listen. And first of all, there's a mighty rushing wind. Will he find the voice of God there? No, he won't. Then there's a mighty earthquake, so large that rocks have split in two. Will he find the voice of God there? No, he won't. Then comes fire. Will he find God there? No, he won't. And then there is a silence. And notice what it says in the reading. Elijah heard it. How can you hear silence? Well, actually, you can. I invite you to try it for yourselves, either in church or at home. And the longer you leave that silence and refuse to allow yesterday's football scores to crowd your mind, or the washing up that you really ought to be getting on with, and just let your mind be emptied before God, then God will fill it with what God wants to say. And at that point, Elijah realises there is more for him to do. He leaves the cave and he goes on his way. Armed with God's promise of faith, 
that there will still be a remnant of 7,000 left in the kingdom of Israel who will be there to be the seeds, if you like, of the new generation. Meanwhile, the feeding of the 5,000 goes on in the New Testament. I hope you're keeping up with this as we switch from the old to the new. Are you all right? Good. Okay. And there we find that the disciples cock a hoop at all that has happened and that they have been part of this wonderful miracle that has happened, think to themselves, great, well, we'll go for a boat trip. That's what they did. They were fishermen. And so Jesus sends them away in the boat and they go off onto the lake and suddenly it becomes a bit stormy and a bit uncomfortable and even they begin to feel a bit seasick. They're not at all sure what's happening. Where exactly is this Jesus? Hang on a minute. He's disappeared. And where did he go to? He went up a mountain by himself to pray, to be silent before God his Father, to fill himself again. And very often in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, not quite so much in Matthew, but certainly in Mark and Luke, Jesus, whenever something significant happens, goes away to recharge his batteries, so to speak, to be silent before God, to pray and to ask what is the next step to regain his courage to go there. Well, Peter, gung-ho as ever, and I'm sure you've done this, haven't you? Sees the Lord walking towards him on the water and says, here, I'd like a go at that. And so he says, if it's you, if it's you, he thinks it is, but he's just hedging his bets a little bit, if it's you, command me to come and walk towards you on the water. And Jesus, who has said, it is I, which is a very strange English construction, isn't it? But it's actually from the original Hebrew, which means I am, which is another word for God. In other words, he's saying, I am God, but they don't quite hear it in the midst of the storm. Jesus says, come. So Peter gets out of the boat, and he starts to walk across the water perfectly well. His faith is strong. He, uh, oh, hold on a minute. There's a bit of wind going on. There's a storm. The laws of nature mean I should be sinking. Oh, I am. And then he realises that's the moment he needs saving. And he shouts out, Lord, save me. Jesus stretches out his hand and does so and says, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? God knows what we are capable of much more than we know. We need courage to live our lives, and it isn't always easy. But when we get in trouble, all we need to do is say, Help me. And we find that Jesus stretches out his hand towards us. But part of that stretching out of the hand is also us stretching our faith and stretching the moments of silence, which we're going to have just now, before I say Amen. If you want to close your eyes, do. But let God speak to you.